So, it's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Jason Yellowland. And I had the opportunity to talk to Jason on the phone uh, a while ago and was highly energized. And I think he's somebody who really walks the talk of uh, bringing community and academia together. So, Dr. Gilliland is the director of the Urban Development Program, and he's a professor of geography, health sciences, and pediatrics at Western. He's also a scientist with the Children's Health Research Institute and the Lawson Health Research Institute. And he's known internationally for his award-winning research on planning and public health issues such as food deserts. And is also well known in the community, having served on dozens of boards and committees working on strengthening the local economy, environment, food security, and children's health. His research has appeared in leading journals such as the American Journal of Public Health, Health and Practice, and Preventative Med Medicine. And he's also funded by a variety of research organizations including the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the Canadian Cancer Society, and the Heart and Stroke Foundation. He's also the director of the Human Environments Analysis Laboratory called HEAL, which is a state-of-the-art interdisciplinary research and training environment specializing in the production, evaluation, synthesis, dissemination, and mobilization of evidence <coughs> to support effective policies, programs, and professional practice aimed at creating healthy and vibrant communities. So I'm really looking forward to him uh, giving his speech. And so welcome, Dr. Gilliland. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, so thank you all for coming, and I also want to thank the organizers for putting together a symposium on uh, encouraging cross-sector collaborations around nutrition. I think that's a fantastic idea. So um, my plan is I want to give you a few of my experiences working with community and perhaps a, a, a few lessons for how we can build effective cross-sector collaborations. So my title is Lessons of a Community Geographer. And I, I know some of you may be thinking, what is a community geographer? And I wouldn't blame you if an image popped into your head of uh, me wandering around a neighborhood with a map in my hand, uh, giving directions, telling people where to go. Uh, and I know some of my collaborators in the, in the crowd know that I'm not against telling people where to go. <laughs> but only when necessary. So. But that's not what I really mean by community geography. Community geography is really an approach to research which is collaborative and participatory. Uh, I like this quote. Uh, it's research involving collaboration and the participation of those of an area affected by an issue for purposes of education action towards affecting positive social, economic, and environmental change. And the important words there are collaboration and participation, but also uh, area, because it's geography, um, but also research to action. So it's, it's really participatory action research with a geographical spin. But also very important to uh, community geography is knowledge translation. I'm always telling my uh, students and my collaborators that knowledge translation isn't just getting your paper published and telling academics or, or presenting your work at fancy conferences in Europe. It's nice, but uh, sometimes you have to present your, co your work at coffee shops or farmers markets to the general public. And knowledge translation is also, as, as some of you, uh, a lot of you know, um, it's, it's a two-way street. It's about exchange. It's not a one-way transfer of information. Um, and it's also integrative. So I think knowledge translation doesn't start when the paper's published. It really starts before you even start the work. So why a participatory and collaborative approach? I think it really comes from the mutual frustration with the traditional research approach. So as researchers, we're frustrated because we don't know if anybody ever reads our articles or if it ever has any impact on the community. And of course the community is frustrated because they remember, oh, those students came in, they poked us and prodded us, or, or they surveyed us, uh, and, uh, and we never knew what happened. What, was that research just to get that thesis done or that publication, or what, was it really supposed to make a difference? But also, the complexity of today's problems. 
They're really too big for a single outside expert to solve or a single organization. Um, problems such as the uh, increasing childhood obesity rates in this country, uh, the sustainability of the local food systems, these are wicked problems, we call them. They're really too complex. There's no one simple solution. And these are some of the things that we're tackling um, in, in the HEAL lab. So what is the HEAL? We already heard a little bit about what, what is the HEAL. It's an interdisciplinary research lab uh, located at Western in the Social Science Building. Uh, as this picture can attest, this is our homepage. Um, students are really at the core of the HEAL. And so we do work on com community. Uh, it's a very multidisciplinary lab. These are, our, our collaborators come from all different disciplines. I have geography at the top there, location, location, location. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but really, um, we, we have faculty members from, from all different faculties, including foods and nutritional sciences, um, as well as uh, a staff and project managers, and, and, so we, and, and members of the public, so from, from the city of London, etc. Our cross-sector community collaborators, this is just a, a <laughs> A crowded graphic of some of the people we've worked with over the past few years. You'll see in the middle there a lot of the, um, uh, the public health units and, and the Southwest Lynn, a great project just starting up with them. As well as we've worked with all of the school boards in the region, the city, many, many different departments in the city, planning, engineering, uh, neighborhood and children's services. Um, the private sector as well. So cross-sector collaboration, in essence, are the academics and nonprofits you see that most? We also have to work with the private sector, and so we've worked with businesses in the Old East Village BIA or the London Development Institute, etc. So I, I apologize if we missed some of the collaborators on this uh, this graphic. Oh, there, there you are. <laughs> so um, now you know a little bit about our approach and um, and us, the Heal. I want to give you just quickly three case studies of community collaborations around food. The first one I want to talk about is food and children's health. And the background on this is uh, over 25% of London's children and youth are currently overweight or obese. And we know that this rate is, is even higher in the rest of the country. And it's, it's, we have a rapidly increasing rates uh, in all developed nations around the world, US, UK, Australia, New Zealand. Um, and why do we care? Well, these have an impact on health outcomes uh, in the long term, in the short long term. So we've been working with a lot of partners. I'm going to talk about the Child and Youth Network. Uh, and so we've been working with a, a working group of the Child and Youth work Network called the Healthy Eating, Healthy Physical Activity Working Group to gather evidence and promote healthier eating. And I've been a member of the Child and Youth Network since its inception. I think it was around 2007, a very, very long time ago. Um, and my students have always been at the table since the very beginning. Now they graduate and leave, but uh, and sometimes they get stolen by our community collaborators for really good jobs, but that's good. <laughs> um, so it's been a wonderful, wonderful arrangement, and, and so we're happy to work with them. And, and the objectives, our mutual objectives in this group, are to improve healthy eating and physical activity through engagement and influencing habits. So I want to give you just a real quick snapshot on one project that we worked on with the HEPA group. Uh, this was the Westminster Neighborhood Demonstration Project. And the, the plan of that project was really to test strategies for influencing the culture of a neighborhood. Now to test them out in a demonstration project, refine them, fix them, see what works, what doesn't work, before we roll it out across the entire city. So our, our team, my students and I, were specifically involved in doing baseline measures back in 2010, uh, doing surveys, looking at healthy body weights, demographic characteristics, lifestyle behaviors, barriers to healthy eating and healthy physical activity. Um, and then in the meantime, there's been some wonderful uh, people working in the community and with the community, uh, doing programming, setting up community gardens, teaching food skills, uh, uh, pop-up farmer, farmer's market came up and, and a lot of other physical activity exercises. And then we went back in the spring of 2014 to do some follow-up measures after all those wonderful programs were, were enacted in the neighborhood. So some real high-level findings, key findings. Uh, we found, actually, that uh, obesity levels uh, among the, the students that we had surveyed between grades 5 and grade 8 uh, had dropped by 13%. Uh, the, the proportion of the students that were uh, meeting the Canada Food Guide 
guidelines for um, fruit and vegetable consumption increased by 16%. And the proportion of students that regularly consumed sugary pop decreased by 15%. So these are wonderful findings. There's cross-sectional studies, not the same group, but I think these are some wonderful key findings from that work. And so this was very inspiring. This type of exercise allowed my students to get really practical experience on the ground, um, and it allowed the CYN to get some of the skills and, and cheap labor from, from my team. <laughs> Another area around food that I've been working on a lot is community food assessments, and specifically uh, mapping access to healthy and unhealthy food. And we've been doing this work with uh, pretty much every public health unit across southwestern Ontario. And uh, we've also been lucky to get some of our cost recovery through the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care's programs. So the background, um, we all know, well, some of you may not know this, I don't know, I assume, that unhealthy community food environments are linked to poor diets and the rise of a lot of diet-related health issues. So not only obesity, but cardiovascular disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, etc. So my team, uh, along with some of the LINs and, and the health units, have been mapping and evaluating access to healthy and unhealthy food outlets throughout South, southwestern Ontario. Um, so for example, this map there, uh, I like that, it's a hotspot analysis type map. For If there are any GIS people, it's inverse distance weighting technique, where we uh, measure access to healthy food. So this is the distance to the nearest grocery store. So all the red areas are, are where um, people may travel up to 35 kilometers to get to a grocery store. And the bright blue, dark blue areas are the areas where they're well served. Um, so we've taken all this type of inter, uh, information and we've generated uh, reports for health units. Uh, it could be on access to reports, but also um, policy recommendations, official plan reviews, all around the issue of food. So the objective of this work, the mutual objective between us and, and the health units, were to really to, to gather high quality evidence regarding um, food deserts, and uh, as well as food swamps. I'm sure you've all heard of those terms. Um, uh, food deserts are disadvantaged areas of a region where they don't have easy access to healthy and affordable food. And food swamps are kind of the reverse where uh, the neighborhood may or may not have access to healthy food, but they're just overwhelmed by, by junk food. And of course, we know that this has important implications. And so with this data, we then provide to the decision makers at the health units, and we make our own recommendations regarding policies, etc. But this allows the, the managers to make evidence-informed decision decisions. So you don't have to read this. This is just a page out of the report we did for the Gray Bruce Health Unit. So we'll do things like mapping access to healthy food outlets. So the blue dots are grocery stores, and the, uh, the green uh, squares are seasonal fruit and vegetable sellers. But as geographers, of course, we have to show off our GIS skills, and we, and we GIS geographic information systems. So we do spatial analysis and spatial statistics on accessing uh, food. So this map there is um, distance to the nearest grocery store in kilometers. The dark brown areas are where people have to travel great distances, so more than 15 kilometers. And, um, but of course, we've also found an academic value. We've done, again, as I said, reports for almost every health unit. But we managed, uh, just last year, well, a couple years ago, we produced an atlas. It was called Putting Children's Health on the Map. And we were looking at the opportunity structures for healthy living for children throughout southwestern Ontario. And this uh, atlas contained over 400 maps for southwestern Ontario. So we did about 40 maps per um, county, per health unit. So we have about over 20 per county level and over 20 for the largest city per, per county. So in addition to access to food, healthy food, we had junk food, and then we had physical activity, et cetera. And that's available free to download off of our HEAL website, www.heal.ca. And, uh, and if you look on the projects link, you can find that. And uh, within the first week that we put that online, we had over 100 downloads from um, decision makers across southwestern Ontario, and now I think we're up to 500 now. And so it's great to, be, to know that people are using this atlas and using the information for their decision making, their program planning. So, and, oh, and that Atlas project was, was funded through Green Shields Canada Foundation and the Children's Health Foundation. So another area that I've been working in uh, is food and community development. So what is the role of food 
for uh, local economic development. And you may not think, well, where's the health aspect of this? But um, you know, if, if, if you don't have a job, if you don't have a strong economy, you typically don't have good health either. So I'm going to talk about some of our work that we've been uh, doing in London's Old East Village. And um, so the main partner there is the Old East Village Business Improvement Area. But uh, again, there's about 20 partners that we've been working with uh, in, in that community. The Community Association being one of them, the Merchants Association, uh, Ministry of Training College and University, Cities of London, etc. So the background objectives. Back in 2004, uh, I arrived in London uh, in 2003, I began in September. And uh, shortly thereafter, I got roped into working in the community uh, by the manager, Sarah Marriott. And uh, back in 2004, the community was an historic neighborhood facing a lot of major socioeconomic issues. It had a struggling business corridor, lack of employment opportunities, a lack, general lack of investment, period, uh, in buildings and retail, etc. And the, the, the only supermarket had recently closed. So that community has already has a really strong history of cross-sector collaboration. They've been engaged in community action research for over 20 years. Um, I became a board member in 2004, a board member of the Old East Village BIA, and now I'm still an advisor. Uh, and <laughs> then I became a board member of well, seven other organizations in the community. But the important thing is my students have been doing community service learning in the neighborhood really since my very first class I taught here in 2004. And a lot of students have been doing work around food. So they've been doing class projects as well as bachelor's theses and now master's theses on the subject of food and really in service of that community. And their objective was to create a vibrant commercial corridor at the heart of a diverse and inclusive community where more people live, work, shop, show, sell, and have fun. And that was my, my objective too, was to help them reach their goal. Um, so some of you have seen this map before. Um, but some of the early research that we did that also uh, identified why we wanted to work in the neighborhood was we looked at the emergence of food deserts in the city of London. So the top map on the left shows where all the supermarkets were located in 1961 with a one kilometer walk zone around them. And then the one on the bottom in 2005 shows where they were located uh, then. And the, the red star there in the middle is the center of Old East Village. So we can see that it was a food desert. And you know, why does that matter? Uh, we did a lot of uh, healthy food basket surveys across the city. So that uh, white bar there is the price of uh, an Ontario Nutritious Food Basket, the 66 item Nutritious Food Basket back in 2005. The average price across all, uh, there were, or I guess, uh, 28 supermarkets back then. And the black bar was the price of how much it cost to fill that basket in the Old East Village without a supermarket. And as you can see, it's about 1.4 times more expensive. So 40% more money had to be spent on your groceries if you lived in that neighborhood. And of course, that really was an economic pressure on people who already had a severe budget constraint. So I had students out there doing these food desert surveys and neighborhood food audits, etc. But you know what? We did it again in 2008, and the prices changed. So the white bar there shows that even after accounting for inflation, the price of groceries in the city, average price of filling that basket rose by about uh, 20 bucks. But the, the price of groceries in Old East Village dropped. Dropped so much to the point that we could no longer classify it as a food desert. So filling that nutritious food basket. So what was it? I know some of you know what the reason was. And we published that paper in the health, uh, uh, journal Health in Place, if anyone wants to know about more of the research side of this work. Well, in 2006, the Western Fair Farmers Market opened. How many of you have been to the Western Fair Farmers Market? Okay, almost everyone, that's, that's good. And for those of you who haven't been there, I want to see you there Saturday. <laughs> So we've been doing a lot of work uh, to figure out, well, what has that impact been? And, you know, we, we, I've learned over the years that uh, politicians really don't care that much about health and social causes, especially municipal ones. You really get them with the economics of the angle. And so, so back in 2001, I had a brilliant student, Michael, who do his honors thesis on um, an economic impact study of the market. And he surveyed about 10% of users. We discovered that about 2,400 people went through there every Saturday. Uh, now it's probably about 4,000, I think. But uh, the weekly average spent in the market per person was about $40, which meant that uh, that had an impact of about 100, almost $100,000 each week was spent in that market. 
So annual spending was almost $5 million, if you count every week. Now the annual recycled spending, knowing that since it's local and a lot of the vendors are buying, putting their money back into the community, whether it's for fertilizer or buying supplies or hiring people, so we do the economic multiplier of 0.46. So recycled spending was about $2.2 million. So it has a huge economic impact. So the market, the people who, who um, run the market were able to use that information to lobby uh, City Hall to use it for, for uh, more funding um, and a lot of different activities. And of course, as geographers, we map the location of all the customers and we found people are coming from all over the city, but particularly from the immediate neighborhood. And what we learned also by looking at what people buy, um, we found that the people who live in the neighborhood who walk there were using it as their grocery store. So they, the, 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 high, the most popular items that they buy were fruits and vegetables, meat and poultry, and, and, and dairy products. So that fulfilled their, their need for a grocery store. So it did have the um, social impacts as, as well. And I, I, I love the study of food because it's not just about health, it's about the triple bottom line. And you've all heard of the three P's, people, places, and profits. So it's about people, the social and the health implications, but also the environmental implications and the profits, the economic implications. We have five P's, but I'll tell you the other two later. So some of the outcomes now, um, the, the, the market is incubating businesses, so a lot of new businesses are starting there. No, I, think, I think the current rent is about 50 bucks a week, whereas if you want to get a, get a storefront, retail front in, in downtown London, you're spending thousands of dollars a month for, for rent, and then if you, you've got about a month or two to make it, and then you start having to mortgage your house, and then you start going belly up by six months if you haven't made it. Here, there's a, there's a place where you can test out an idea, see if it works, and if it doesn't work, well, you know, you're not out of pocket that much. Um, and some of these businesses are expanding onto the corridor. Since uh, I started working there in 2004, I think we've seen about 14 new food-related businesses. Um, and some of the great businesses, like you can see pictures there of the root cellar and, and the artisan bakery and the, the, the cheese, uh, all about cheese, et cetera. They, they've come from the market and expanded onto the corridor, creating more jobs in the community, being open all around, all week. And there's been a growth of alternative business models like co-ops, et cetera. So we're still working in there. As a matter of fact, my uh, undergrad student, Michael, ended up getting hired by the Old East Village BIA to be a senior researcher. So he's been working, still steady working there. Uh, they don't have any money for him anymore, so I'm paying him still to work there. And, uh, and he, while well, he's doing his master's thesis with me. And, uh, and he's still doing the customer surveying and mapping on the corridor and, and serving business owners for their best practices. And we're still working on creating a really solid local economic development plan. So, I'm going to start getting into the discussion period. What is community geography? Well, we know it's not standing outside on the margins and treating the community like a fishbowl. So observing everything but not getting in there. Every now and then sprinkling a little intervention and see what happens. You know? It's about diving right in. It's about immersing yourself in the community. It's about feeling the water, testing the waters, but getting right in there. And occasionally, you might get bitten, but uh, it, it, it's a wonderful trip. <clears throat> so, why do we do all this work? Well, it's not completely based on our own generosity. There are wonderful benefits for a researcher for cross-sector collaboration. First and foremost, it helps us identify worthwhile research questions. I am never at a loss for ideas of what to research next. I have too many ideas. And I get most of those ideas from my community collaborators. Uh, so it, it's wonderful. There's never a shortage. Engagement improves recruitment and retention. So when you're in community, your, your participation rates for studies are through the roof compared to other people who want to just drop in there, drop some surveys, and head out. So I, I get a lot of um, participation and uptake from the work that I do because I'm there on the ground. Uh, it ensures that your research is relevant and impactful. So you know that when you have finished this or even throughout the process, you're going to really have a, a, an impact on that community, an impact for health. And so this is true knowledge translation. This is, this is what we're supposed to be working at. Um, and because of that, it has a meaningful experiences for students. So my students, uh, on each one of those projects I showed you, I've had students who've been there and then gotten jobs out of it. So they get a line on their CV, they get great data. Sometimes they even get summer, summer funding out of these projects but it really means that they never have to explain, justify to their grandma why they're researching what they're researching, because people get it. 
Um, privileged access to data. Some of you quantitative people in the audience know that one of the hardest things is, can you get the data? Well, we often, working with different organizations, we're on the inside. We get privileged access to this prime data that some people would, would only dream of. Alternative sources of funding. Uh, I've had a lot of funding outside of the Tri-Council, the, the CIHR and the Shirks. Um, this allows us to tap into funding that only a nonprofit or a charity would be able to access. And so we've actually helped a lot of nonprofits and charities write grant applications. And some of that funding can go towards supporting students to do the work. And there are co-learning opportunities. So it's not just about our students learning from doing the work. I've learned an awful lot. Um, I've said this before that I think one of my most important teachers that I've ever had in my life is, is the former manager of the Old East Village of BIA, Sarah Merritt. She's actually taught me so much about how to do this kind of research, do this impactful community. So I've learned just as much as the people in the community have learned from me. But of course, the community planner collaborators do benefit greatly. They get access to fresh new ideas, cutting edge research, and of course, cheap labor, often free labor. And, and really keen labor, the students, right? Um, it allows them to get access to up-to-date equipment and software. A lot of these, some, sometimes we work with organizations that are only one or two people. They're constantly struggling to keep the doors open. So we, we have high-speed computers, and sometimes we can donate old desks, you know, don't, donate old computers. The software that we use costs $40,000 for a site license. Well, you know, they can't afford that. And so that's the highest, best, highest and best use of resources. I don't have to explain this to, to medical officers of health at health units, that really they should have us do their, their GIS and their spatial analysis or the stats. Because they don't have the money to, to train one of their person staff members who's already overworked, already. And, or, and as I said, sometimes site licenses are can be up to $40,000 for software. Well, for a few thousand dollars of cost recovery, they can hire us, they can hire one of my students to do the work. So that's really, let's get people doing the best thing that they're best suited for. Um, for, for, like, researchers get access to alternative sources of funding, so do the community collaborators. So we've helped community collaborators write grants, but sometimes we can also um, include some of the community work in our own grants. For example, I have a, a two CIHR grants right now uh, doing work with the Child and Youth Network. And because of that, uh, we estimated that our in-kind support for the CYM last year from my lab was over $200,000. And we're uh, in kind support over from year to year. We're probably at least thirty thousand dollars per year. Um, so that works out greatly. Co-learning and community capacity building. So um, we are we are helping these communities get work done, building capacity for doing research or building capacity for whatever it is that they want to do. Um, we don't just jump in there and leave, and then they're all at a loss. You know, we always make sure that there's a sustainability plan. So if if, if we leave, are they going to be able to keep this type of work up? And of course, it can enrich and improve outcomes. So um, often, if they involve students or, or, or researchers from Western, um, they can achieve better and bigger outcomes than they could ever do on their own. But there are general challenges. Um, bureaucracy. Western's not the only place with bureaucracy. Uh, restrictive data sharing agreements. Often it comes, the bigger the organization, the more the bureaucracy. So. They want you to do a project, but and they even want to pay you to do a project, but they can't give you the data. So someone else on them, some other silo in the organization has the data and they don't want to give it to you. So uh, that's that's frustrating. Slower decision making. You have to slow the pace. And I, I got to remind myself to slow down while I'm talking because I need to keep going. And it, we we want to keep moving. But sometimes in community, if you only have meetings bi-monthly and everyone has to vote on it. You know, sometimes if you don't get that vote in, sometimes you're waiting two months before you can proceed to the next thing, and then to the next thing. So you just have to real, be, realize that it's, there's a different pace. Timing mismatch. You know, at Western, we have uh, theses. Students come in at a certain time. Grants are announced, to, you know, six months later, you know whether you're successful after you apply for it. But sometimes community needs it now, yesterday. The funding all has to be spent by next week, but it's six months worth of work. So, um, you know, that's, that's a difficult challenge that we always face. The dis dilemmas of dissemination. Uh, we, we, we go by the rule that we won't release any work uh, if it's going to harm the community. Obviously, ethically, we have to do no harm. But it means a lot of stuff doesn't necessarily get out. Or you do an awful lot of work in this area, and then um, 
well, it's just not worth publishing, really. <laughs> you know, the vast majority of it is may not be traditionally academically rigorous um, that uh, you know that will count at the university or that will count to a peer reviewer, but still, some really simple research can have a big impact. Funding and cost recovery. There's never enough money. Uh, at the smaller the organization, they spend 60% of their time trying to keep the doors open. And so um, I find myself often paying students to volunteer. I have students paying, paying my staff who are volunteering for these organizations. So we have to be creative about that. One-way relationships, we have to make sure that it's not always us doing all the work and never getting anything in return. And that can lead to volunteer burnout, or what we say committee fatigue. I know some of the people in the audience here I'm on at least two committees with. And uh, so, you know, and, and I have data. <laughs> so the final slide, my overall lessons learned. Sometimes simple research can be incredibly invaluable for community. So just because you don't think it's ridiculously rigorous or it's the way you would do it if you were applying for a CIHR grant, it can still be very impactful for community. Simple dots on a map showing where customers are from can help. Uh, research needs more open data. Come on, cities, municipalities, etc. If it's not, if it's a, un anonymize the data and then let's have us get the researchers out there doing their highest and best needs. We have data sharing agreements, but also IP agreements. When I often work in certain areas, um, if, 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 it's, if I'm new to a group, I often discuss, well, you know, we're going to do this, and we're going to do a lot of in-kind work. I, I would like the opportunity for a student to be able to use this later on for a thesis, or a publication if it's worth it. We'll, of course, vet it by you, but... So we define the scope and expectations early. I think you've got to manage the expectations when you work with the community, because you know, if you do good work and you can constantly get brought in, brought in, and I'm a yes guy and I, and I don't want to let anyone down, but it, it can really uh, take up all your time. And again, I do have that day job. Uh, so, memorandums of understanding, get letters of collaboration, uh, discuss about what you can do and you can't do. Again, seek funding together, that's very important, uh, so that you can all benefit. Do find the academic value in the work you're doing, do look for it. Don't come in there right away, the very first thing, come to the table and say, hello CYN, I, I want some money, or I want you to write a letter of support. You don't know me, but I've got this idea. Because um, that can sometimes upset other people who've been at the table for eight years, you know, slogging away, donating their time. So don't rush it. You have to nurture relationships, build long-term relationships, and build trust, particularly when you're working in vulnerable communities. Um, so I, you know, I don't send students, let students loose in the Old East Village without discussing it, with working on it. And people have, often when so, another Western student wants to work in that community, they get, they they come to me because they've been told by a community member they have to clear it with me first. Even if they're students in business or health sciences, they have to clear it with me because uh, that's trust. Consider sustainability. So again, don't set someone up with a high-end stats program and a system that they're not going to be able to use if you leave. And sometimes you do have to have an exit plan. So how is this going to work out when you leave? Um, and finally, you got to celebrate successes because it's a long, hard work. It's a long slog. So you know, I mentioned the three P's of people, places, and profits. But we have a fourth, which is policy. You got to make policy. And the fifth is parties. You know, <laughs> you gotta, you know, gotta so thank you very much.